River Committee. That is one committee, and this is the meeting, <laughs> so welcome everyone. Uh, I am joined by my colleague Tom Labonge, and we have a special guest, our colleague Paul Koretz today. Uh, and um, I would like to call this meeting to order. Uh, and uh, Mr. Labonge, what I'd like to do is take things out of order. I'd like, I'd like to start with item two, then move to five, one, three, and four. Okay, I'm good. And so, uh, with yeah, without objection, there. Uh, what I'd like to do at this time is um, take item two. Item number two is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Becca Doton to the Board of Recreation and Parks Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2016. Thank you, Richard. And it's my understanding that that uh, has been pulled, so uh, withdrawn. So what I'd like to do is uh, note and file item two without objection. And having said that, I'd like to then move to uh, item five, please. Item number five is a Department on Disability report relative to proposed contracts for on-call sign language interpreting, captioning, and video remote interpreting services. Thank you. And I think we already have Terry Sauer up here from the CAO's office. Yes. Ms. Sauer, uh, please. Uh, Noreen Vincent, you're here, the city attorney. Okay. City oh, attorney yes. Ms. Department Vincent, please. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, we've been asked to report, uh, write a report on this uh, item. Uh, we will be reporting back to your committee at the next regular committee meeting. Um, we are working with the department and the city attorney to address our concerns and some of the technical issues with the contracts. Um, so it's our hope that at the regular meeting on the 27th, we will have a report available okay. for you. Okay, because the, I understand multiple contracts are pending approval. There's a timeline. Um, are there, so you're aware of modifications? Correct, yes. There, there do need to be ratification clauses in some of the contracts, and which the city attorney has advised us. There are also some issues in terms of the term of the contract because it's inconsistent in what was included in the request for proposal. So we will work with the department and the city attorney, and when we come back with a report, we'll address all the items and have a series of recommendations to address our concerns so that you can move these forward in a timely manner. Okay, terrific. So... Our, our next upcoming regular meeting is one week from today, and you'll be able to put the report together in, yes. in that amount of time. My, my, one week. Yeah, my staff oh. might, might not be happy, but yes, I'm committing yeah, them to do it. Because we want to serve the people, and this is the yeah, people it, who have yeah, it will be, greater needs than you and I. Yes, and okay. it will, we, will be be, we will be back here next Monday. Terrific, terrific. And uh, um, Mr. Clerk, are there any comment cards for this item? Um, no, not at this time. Okay, thank you, sir. And then so we will continue the item until next week uh, with the instruction uh, that Terry uh, so articul was so articulate with, and uh, we'll be looking forward to that report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we can go to item one, sir. Item number one is a communication from the mayor and a communication from the City Ethics Commission relative to the appointment of Mr. Robert Williams to the Commission on Disability for the term ending June 30th, 2017. Terrific. Thank you. Mr. Williams, please have a seat. Thank you very and much. You bet, and welcome. Welcome to the committee, and congratulations on uh, your uh, appointment from the mayor. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I read your, your extensive resume, and, uh, but please share some of your experience with us. I'm glad to do so. And first of all, I bring you greetings from Bishop Bruno, who sends you his best, and we're glad to be of service in the life of the city. He's got the greatest administrative office next to the greatest lake that Mitchell Farrell could reorganize. So that's a beautiful compound Great spot. church that you have there. The Cathedral Center, and I'm a resident of the Great Council District 4, so there we are even better. <laughs> Quite fine. I've been with the diocese. I'm in my 29th year of service to the Episcopal Diocese. And as you know, the diocese has several institutions that assist persons living with disabilities. I like to emphasize the word ability in the word disabilities. Uh, we all have skills and gifts, and the diocese is very good about supporting those and calling them out. The Hospital of the Good Samaritan, uh, St. Barnabas Senior Center, Hillsides Home for Children, Neighborhood Youth Association. 
you know the record of the diocese. Mm -hmm. And personally, I attended the retreat meeting of the commission recently, and I was very impressed with Stephen and the staff and all they're doing, especially in terms of disaster preparedness, um, the Office of HIV AIDS, um, and reaching out to the hearing impaired, the elderly, all of the above, and employment practices. Mm -hmm. I think that the strategic partnerships that the city seeks to uh, forge with the volunteer and community uh, agencies is a good priority and one that I can be helpful with. Wonderful. Uh, I have a, just a really two main questions, and that is big picture, global, you look at it from the lens of, you know, with your, your, your experience uh, and incoming commissioner, what do you think are the, the biggest opportunities for the city as a whole? I believe the biggest opportunity for the city as a whole is to provide all of its residents with hope and with quality of life and with accessible services so that there's transportation, that there's access at curbside, uh, so that hearing and sight and all of these areas that we can help people to live as fully as, as they deserve to live. We have in our Episcopal tradition uh, the saying from the baptismal covenant, we believe in the dignity of every person, and we respect the dignity of every person, and I believe that assisting those who have disabilities is part of that respect for our fellow human beings. Well said. Interestingly enough, right across from the Episcopal Church of St. Paul's there at Echo Park Lake, with the recent... Um, restoration of the Echo Park Lake didn't even include installing an ADA ramp that crosses Echo Park Avenue to Laguna where the church is. Mm -hmm. That was uh, a secondary step that we took and we're about to install a traffic signal there as well that Thank will be for that. pedestrian activated. Thank you. That's much needed. Oh, sure. No problem. But it, it just... Okay. Thank you. It just underscores the... When you think that that would be an obvious sort of um, need in terms of infrastructure improvements. Um, it wasn't necessarily noticed like it should have been. So there's a real opportunity, I think, for all of us uh, to work together on, on uh, making sure that those sort of gaping holes in the system are, are filled. Thank so uh, what are, having said that, what are some of your, your priorities? What would you... Uh, in terms of priorities, uh, just a word of preamble, two of our bishops live with disabilities. As you know, Bishop Bruno is himself an amputee, which has opened the eyes to the faith community of how a person can get along and move around very well, but still has to watch. Another of our bishops uh, has hearing impairment and wears t dual hearing aids. And so we're very conscious at all times about proper amplification. Again, this a matter of accessibility. And I feel that as priorities, what I can bring to this equation, I also serve as vice president of the Interreligious Council of Southern California. I feel it's not only the Episcopal Church, but it's all of our faith communities working together, raising visibility. I think that I can be of assistance to the department in, in communication primarily with these various faith groups and building bridges. Already one of the staff members and I have had a conversation around disaster preparedness. And we th know that disaster preparedness is a huge issue, but imagine, as we know, for those who are living with disabilities, it's, mm -hmm. it's a double question. Um, egress, getting out of buildings, these sorts of things. And I'd like to look carefully at that. Mm -hmm. I also feel that uh, many of the elderly who are living with disabilities, I feel that is an area of priority. And also the homeless mentally ill is an enormous problem, as we know, in our city. And while it's not necessarily a specific brief, as I understand it, of the commission, it might be an area where we mm -hmm. begin to focus a little Terrific. More. Well, I think your background and your experience informs you really well for this committee. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Yeah, just uh, ask you to uh, work with the State Department of Disability and get a zip code of where the highest propensity of people who are in wheelchairs or whatever uh, disabled bound, and then tell Public Works Commissioner Kevin James and others, let's focus where the most need is, yep. not just there where the most need is, and it's try to go on. It's, and then the other thing, too, which is interesting, and I'm going to mention it to you, as I passed Echo Park Lake this afternoon on my way downtown, I saw there's someone in, made an encampment in the public stairs. I don't think the, the, the way the city attorney's office made the agreement with uh, people camping on the street uh, is 
that, 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 that yeah. permits people from walking up the public stairs, mm -hmm. which is something to look at. So anyway, that's on the west side of yeah. the lake. But yeah, we're, we'll we're talk. We should that, talk to this. They should really. Uh, that's not what yeah. should be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank Say you. hi to Bishop Bruno. I will do so. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so uh, since since we don't have a quorum and, and Mr. Kretz is our guest, uh, it was just two of us on the committee. Uh, we will uh, waive you forward to council as an instruction from the chair, but um, I want to commend the mayor for your appointment. Thank you, and I just I think you'll be great on the commission. So thank you. Thank you, and we'll see you in council. I appreciate that. Thank you thank so you. much. All, of you. All right, sir. I'd like to now go to item three. Item number three is motion Corretz O'Farrell Bonin relative to requesting the city attorney to prepare and present an ordinance which would prohibit the growth of genetically modified crops within city limits. This item is also referred to the Energy and Environment and the Planning and Land Use Management Committees. Wonderful. We do have lots of comment cards on this. However, um, our colleague Paul Koretz uh, is here to speak on this item uh, and then another item. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give the floor to Mr. Koretz um, because this has long been a passion of his, and I'm just so proud to be a, a co-introducer of this effort. Uh, and uh, so with, with that, uh, I'll turn the, the floor over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership on both this and the rodenticide uh, issue that's uh, both before the committee today. I know you and your staff have been working <coughs> very hard on this, and, and I appreciate it. Uh, uh, tomorrow we're celebrating Food Day at City Council, but today I think we're recognizing Poisons Day here in Arts Parks Committee. As a society, we've gotten too effective at poisoning the things we don't find convenient, like the insects who eat our food crops, or weeds that grow in the fields, or rats, or squirrels in our parks, so that we've inadvertently begun the wholesale systematic poisoning of the creatures that we do like butterflies and songbirds and raptors, owls, falcons, hawks, bobcats, foxes, and most famously, uh, our Griffith Park mountain lion, the P-22. We also end up poisoning farm workers and children and pets along the way as well. And most problematic of all, we're poisoning our, the pollinator that is absolutely essential, uh, perhaps to human life, certainly our, our entire food system, which are our bees. When we poison the creatures most vital to our existence, we're poisoning ourselves. And worse of all, the pesticide industry is now testing robo-bees so that when they destroy the bees that we have, uh, they'll have a way to, to try and replace them. Um, if this doesn't define insanity, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what does. So that's why we're here today. We need to find a better way of doing things. We need to find a better way of raising crops so that we replenish our soils and oceans rather than stripping them of their life. We need better ways to address our rodents without causing the kind of harm that we're causing. And a year ago this week, uh, amazingly enough, over 90 scientists from the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility um, they have to find a cat to your name of that at some point, um, released a statement saying, as scientists, physicians, academics, and experts from the disciplines relevant to the scientific, legal, social, and safety assessment aspects of genetically modified organisms, we strongly reject claims by GMO seed developers and some scientists, commentators, and journalists that there is a scientific consensus on GMO safety and the debate on the topic is over. We feel compelled to issue this statement because the claim consensus on GMO safety does not exist. Their individual statements go on to talk about people's allergic reactions to product, products containing GMOs, the negative impacts of increased pesticide use, the creation of pesticide resistant superbugs and superweeds, the problems with monocropping, and much, much more. Which means the pesticide companies have been conduct conducting an unapproved scientific experiment on us since the early 90s without our consent, simply to sell more pesticides without really guaranteeing the safety of human beings and the environment. Well, I think every scientific experiment needs a control group 
and I think that should be us. We, know, we want to conduct our own experiment in Los Angeles and make all 503 square miles of Los Angeles a GMO-free growing zone. So let's see what that does for our health, for soil health, for pollinator health, and let's see what it does for economic development. With the recent decline in the amount of farmland across the country, the city and the state have seen the importance of growing and promoting our, our own local food systems. We recently allowed uh, folks to grow uh, edible plants in our parkways. Um, the LA Food Policy Council has been pushing its Healthy Neighborhood Markets Network. Um, farmer mar farmers markets are everywhere you look. Um, Council Member Price, uh, a member of this committee, just introduced a motion to implement a state bill, AB 551, to create urban agriculture incentive zones where property owners can use their land for agricultural purposes and get a tax break. Um, there are other legislation in this same direction as well. And so our urban farmers and our cottage food movement need the protection of a GMO-free zone, a protection from seed drift, which they found recently in several places in the country, particularly Montana and Oregon with GMO wheat. A GMO-free zone could potentially create a, a lucrative grown-in-L.A. brand. Um, and the Seed Library of Los Angeles and our urban farmers brought this issue to me and I want to close by mentioning their concerns. Uh, this is also about seed purity. As we've seen from the Ebola situation, an ec epidemic can spread like lightning. And the same thing applies to plants. Monocropping like they do with GMO crops is dangerous for the food supply. We need to protect seed diversity so that if one strain of plants fails, another will sustain us. So as an example, in 1903, we had 307 varieties of sweet corn. By 1983, there were 12. This is the wrong direction for a society that wants to remain resilient and healthy. Now, if you look at the, the endorsements of this, I think you'll be impressed by the number of endorsers, as well as some of the different groups represented. Communities for a Better Environment, the Latino Diabetes Association, the Community Health Councils, the Sierra Club, uh, food and Water Watch, several churches, several neighborhood councils, and restaurants and food stores. And lastly, GMO plant varieties are controlled by corporations through patents, wherein farmers are forbidden from saving seeds to grow the next year. For me, urban agriculture is all about the fact that we're all in this together. It's about growing fruit trees and parkways and incentivizing ways to create urban farms and gardens. Most of all, it's about saving and sharing seeds, creating good, clean, healthy food for everyone, and protecting our bee populations. And so uh, I thank you for your support on this committee and your consideration, and ask you for your and I vote. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. And this ordinance will prohibit the growing of genetically modified crops with within city limits. It further specifies that the ordinance should prohibit each of the following practices related to the growing of GM crops within city limits, the planting of genetically modified seeds, the sale of GM seeds by vendors, the sale of any seeds that could potentially be contaminated by other GMOs, and the sale of GM fruit trees and plants. Uh, and with that, we will uh, start the public comment. Uh, Card section, and we have yeah we have lots of comments on this item and item four, so we're going to have to limit to limit them to one minute each. Otherwise, we'll be having dinner together. So, <laughs> so uh, let's just do the one minute thing, and we're going to start uh, with Gladys Limon will be our first uh, commenter, followed by Heather Hyde. Ms. Limon, and I have to say this is a fine group of people. So if we had to have dinner with someone. <laughs> Uh, this would be a group that you wouldn't mind having. And it would be organic. Yes, please. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Gladys Limon. I am a staff attorney with Communities for a Better Environment. I'm happy to be before the committee today in strong support of this motion. 
when we think and talk about the consequences of genetically modified crops, the issues that generally first come to mind are those concerning our ecosystem, such as destruction of biodiversity and the collapse of bee colonies. Those issues are indeed critical to our human survival. The consequences to human health appear to be more nebulous because there are questions about the immediate effects to our physical health. But as CBE discussed in the letter that we submitted last week, genetically modified crops have a direct and even deadly effect on human health. Contrary to often repeated claims from the agrochemical industry, the crops require vast amounts of dangerous pesticides and herbicides. The group most at risk are farm workers and those who live in communities where GM crops are cultivated, the great majority of whom are Latino and bear a deadly burden. Uh, the people of Los Angeles and generally our children are also at risk. You can wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make one point. Um, the food that we eat is an important source of exposure to pesticides, such of which, such, some of which contains pesticides residue above levels considered safe by the federal government. Parents of small children in Los Angeles should be particularly concerned since children consume large quantities of fruit and fruit juices, which contain pestici pesticide residue. Children consume these foods at levels from 3 to 23 one times greater than the average adult American. Surface water and groundwater near places where GM crops are cultivated are also contain high concentrations of pesticides. In short, we strongly support this motion. Thank you for cons your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Limon. Thank you. And we have Heather Hyde, who will be followed by David King, who will be followed by Rosemary Jenkins. Hello. I Hello, Ms. Hyde. Thank you for your time today. And obviously, you know all of the facts. And uh, after uh, Mr. Koretz had made his statement, but. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is what, I don't understand what's happening to this world, what's happening to nature, what's happening to these small communities, people that thrive off of, you know, things happening naturally and evolving naturally. And I fully support farmers markets when they don't use GMOs, and I'd much rather live in a society and grow up and eventually if I have children, you know, provide a world where we're not about mass consumption, mass mass uh, consumption, mass building, and just overall bigger is not always better. Faster is not always better. In fact, I feel like people's health and, and their integrity are ruined by, you know, the process of GMOs and what's happening and, you know, large corporations, the, thing, the things that they're doing to this environment. And I feel like so many people could so easily turn a blind eye. Mm -hmm. I just can't do that. So. Well, thank, thank you for you. being here today, Ms. Hyde. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. King. Thank you. Um, I couldn't have said uh, the lines from uh, Councilman Koretz any better than myself. Um, he certainly made a lot of good points. These are petitions that have been signed by people in support of this measure. Um, and we have many more signatures as well. I'd also like to point out one of the things that, that one of the big concerns in our 503 square miles of Los Angeles is that corn pollen or the pollen of GMO plants will spread freely by wind and it will w spread out to an area up to 25 miles away from the source and we cannot protect against that so if we really want to have an urban farm ag movement, a fur urban ag movement, then we have to have control of the GMOs. We can't let that pollen be in our, in our uh, atmosphere around here, and we can't let it cross with our plants because then they are compromised. Everybody who's growing a private garden is interested in growing GMO-free food, and that's my point. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Jenkins will be followed by Joanne. Poirot and uh, Finian make peace. Hi, I'm Rosemary Jenkins, chair of the Northeast Valley Green Alliance. I'm also a regular columnist for City Watch and LA Progressive. And back in August, I sent each of you a letter urging you to um, to support this ban on uh, the GMO issues that we're talking about now. Now, specifically, San Fernando Valley gets the Santa Ana winds, and so, as was mentioned earlier, there's that issue uh, dealing with uh, the cross-pollinization problems. We have a lot of people, uh, it's horse territory up in the Silmar area, people are feeding horses, people are feeding their 
backyard chickens. They're growing home gardens, school gardens. Uh, Silmar High School has a wonderful garden that uh, disseminates <coughs> their uh, and distributes their crops all over the city. And uh, we have urban gardens as well. We're working on one at Mission College, for instance. And so it's really I imperative that we ensure that all these people that are growing these gardens uh, do so with knowing that they're using healthy uh, seeds, et cetera, and uh, distributing the same in, in terms of fruit and vegetables. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Uh, we have Joanne Poirot. Am I saying that right? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for considering this uh, motion. Um, we have collected endorsements from over 61 organizations, a uh, very diverse assortment of organizations to show that this is not a single issue uh, uh, motion. Ultimately, this issue is about the seeds. These are home saved seeds that uh, the GMO uh, that producing companies would like to outlaw. When we look at the future of our food supply, we look at drought-tolerant crops. These are uh, black-eyed peas from the desert southwest. They are already naturally drought-tolerant. There are generations of plant, traditional plant breeding invested in these seeds. And uh, we have right now there are studies going on to find uh, drought-tolerant GMO crops. Well, there are 153 varieties of traditionally bred seeds that are in those comparison studies, and uh, the or, uh, scientific magazine Nature says that the GMO uh, is about 10 years from being anywhere close to producing drought-tolerant food. Great points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Finian Makepeace, who will be followed by Lorna Paisley and Andrew Douglas. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Finian Makepeace from Kiss the Ground. Uh, I just wanted to thank Coretz for covering most of the things that we wanted to cover so I could be quicker. Uh, this is a pile of about over a thousand signed info cards against or for this motion. I really wanted to touch on the soils. I'm with the group that's about rebuilding soil and the technologies of GMOs are of past. We have technology and science now that can rebuild our soil and not only are these pesticides and herbicides that are being applied and the GMOs that are allowing for them to be applied killing us and many other giving us sicknesses, but they're killing the very life in our soil. And the life in our soil is the most important thing for us to be able to exist and live bountifully. So we need to rebuild our soil, and with the GMOs, there's no push to rebuilding our soil. They're, they're making our soil worse and worse and worse, which makes GMOs being able to use themselves more. And they, they want pesticides to be used because it continues to give them a bigger market. So. We are for this motion. Thank you. These are all signed for, for this motion. So Terrific. If you want it's a technical tomorrow, question, because I listened to what you said. If you had a pile of water there and, and a bucket mm -hmm. and a pile of dirt here, what would you pick? Uh, I'd probably pick the, the water for right for, now. I wanted to hear that, because what I heard you said the soil was most important. Well, this water is most important. It is, but if we don't have soil built, the water just runs off the land and takes all, right. all the nutrients with it. I know, but it. water... Yeah, water okay. starts with soil. Got it. Okay. Soil, you don't get any water. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Makepeace. Okay. Thank you. Now we have Lorna Paisley. Hi, and thank you for hearing us. I'm an organic gardener. I put beer out at night to kill slugs and any other bugs that like to drink. During the day, I swat bugs into soap water or smash them with my bare fingers. That's a lot of bother to be organic, and I don't want people in a several-mile radius pollinating my Swiss chard, my beets, my broccoli, my zucchini, or yellow squash or sweet, sweet corn with GMOs. And why? Because GMOs have never been proven safe. Some contain BT pesticide in every cell that ruptures the stomach of the insects that eat it. Some are Roundup ready. Main ingredient, glyphosate, which makes them tolerant of lots of Roundup. There's a lot of research showing Roundup damages DNA and is linked to lymphoma, brain cancer, and kidney and liver diseases. There's research showing a 99% correlation between Alzheimer's and all autism. Roundup is a chelator. It kills by pulling nutrients out of the plant and it kills beneficial microorganisms, which make nutrients available to plants. Um, Roundup has been found in our water, air, and soil, and it's even been found in mother's breast milk. So, do, 
we really do need to keep GMOs and the herbicides associated with them out of LA. Thank you, Ms. Paisley. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Douglas will be followed by Lori Bennett and Sylvia Arroya. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman O'Farrell, and thank you very much, Councilman Labonge and Councilman Koretz, for your um, attention to this issue. Uh, I was born in Topeka, Kansas, in the same hospital as my father. And my mom's side of the family came from Shawnee, Oklahoma area. And I was raised in Virginia. So as an adult, I lived my entire adult life in California um, as a grower. So there's a direct link between uh, democracy and sovereignty and the growing of food here. Um, this is not going to be a trend at all. Um, the USDA from now on, starting in their next agricultural census, um, nationwide they're going to incorporate urban agriculture as part of it. They've also established a $70 million startup fund to promote urban agriculture. Um, Governor Brown just established a farm to f um, a fork program for California to get this stuff um, in lower um, nutrient de uh, deficit areas, good food in their stomachs. And so this is actually fortifying and protecting a lot of legislation that's already occurring, and we don't know what they're going to come up with next. They just are the same people that gave us DDT and Agent Orange. Don't forget that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Douglas. You. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Thank you so much for uh, addressing this and being here today. My name is Lori Bennett. I'm with the Seed Library of Los Angeles. I'm a U.S. military veteran, former firefighter, mother, organic gardener, and amongst other things, all of which really rotate around the issue of GMOs and the use of the glycophosphates for them. Uh, as a veteran, I've been exposed and know people who have been exposed both themselves and their children have had birth defects. Um, the problem with this is that, besides what everyone else here has said today, it creates a stress level. The stress for anyone that's a parent, that's a gardener, anyone of responsibility uh, or wisdom, anyone with disabilities does not want more of a toxic load than they're already exposed to in a big city like Los Angeles. So introducing or allowing for GMO crops and cross-pollination of any sort will then increase the stress level in the city. Um, as a veteran, therapeutic measures for PTSD and a lot of other things um, look at the stress level of people. There are gardening projects for veterans, of which I've been involved, and I believe having LA be a GMO-free zone will give more optimism, more um, encouragement in this city throughout the nation and the world to pave the way and show how valuable this is as a movement that you are leaders of. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have, we're going to have Sylvia Ar Arroya. Yes. Uh, followed by Jason with no last name on the card and then Penelope McMillian. McMillan, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. As a natural health practitioner and coming from a country where I grew up with just natural food, I can see the big difference. What GMOs do on people, especially the immune system is affected, which is the defense of the human body. I have treated so many people in the last 20 years with allergies, weird allergies, that they respond to nothing natural or drugs because the immune system has been very well, terribly damaged. I think that is enough. If your immune system gets affected, that's it. You cannot live a natural life or a healthy life. That will be all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we have Jason. <clears throat> um, I, um, I think uh, Councilman Recretz, uh, uh spoke on a lot of the things that I wanted to mention uh, and also uh, the previous speaker, uh, David, uh, speaking about um, that nature or GMO seeds or, or pollen, uh, it doesn't respect any uh, boundaries that man sets up. So that is, a, that is an issue that we have to um, be, uh, be aware of and um, uh, potentially take some action on uh, that, it, 
you know, it crosses borders that regardless. Um, but uh, I just want to voice my um, support in uh, maintaining the integrity of uh, our food system and uh, to protect what we've uh, so far um, built to date. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and then Penelope McMillan will be followed by uh, Caroline Muniz and Walker Foley. Uh, I also support this, and I, I have absolutely nothing to add to what Mr. Corrett said. I wish I had a copy of what you, uh, what you wrote so I could read it to all my friends. I'll bet he'll make it available for you. Thank you so much. Thank we you. will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Muniz. Carol, I'm sorry, Carolyn Munoz. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for hearing us today. Um, I am a holistic health care practitioner. I am a, a raw food chef, and I am a teacher. I work with LAUSD. I teach nutrition through after-school program. Um, I am getting prepared to put in a school garden, and I'm very frightened that our crops are going to be contaminated by GMO overflow. And... Um, I have to say that I have been teaching uh, for five years now, and every year there are more and more students with allergies, more and more students with skin conditions, more and more students not being able to focus, and it's really getting frightening. It's like basically the bell goes off and they start walking into walls. It's middle school, so there's a little bit of that that you should expect anyway, but I see it progressing year after year after year, and I see what they're eating, and it's all genetically modified. Um, I also want to bring to attention that we have such a drought right now, and genetically modified seeds take a lot more water, almost three times the amount of water to grow. And in a time of drought, we really should not be allowing that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Walker Foley will be followed by Teresa Brady and Bruce Campbell. Hi there. Uh, my name is Walker, and I'm here with Food and Water Watch, and we work to ensure that the food, water, and fish we consume is safe, accessible, and sustainable. Um, and we urge you to support this motion. Uh, Los Angeles has made many great strides in allowing urban agriculture, but we believe the security of a budding new urban agriculture industry could be threatened um, by the cross-contamination of GMO pollen uh, to locally grown non-GMO crops. So by securing Los Angeles' 502 square miles as a GMO-free zone, the city can better um, protect its urban farms from unintentional contamination. Um, and Los Angeles has done incredible work this year uh, to secure rights for pollinators and um, the state widely through 551 to secure rights for urban farmers. Um, and, you know, not only do uh, these GMO crops require more pesticides, which harm po pollinators, uh, some of these GMO crops are engineered to poison insects on contact. Um, and what we're really witnessing today is the corporate consolidation of our food supply. So it is our belief that Los Angeles is taking a visionary role here and needs to show and continue that leadership on this issue to protect its residents, its urban farms, and to uh, set an example not only to the state, but, you know, to the rest of the country. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foley. <clears throat> Teresa Brady. Hi. I'm here to present uh, the letter from the Angeles chapter of the Sierra Club, okay. Hillary... Uh, it's already probably in the record we emailed it in, but also I wanted to make a couple of points that are from the um, Sierra Club biotech policy. One is that we um, ask for a, a acts in cordon, accordance with the precautionary principle, and GMOs are not in accordance with the precautionary principle. They've been assumed to be um, substantially equivalent and as a lot of people have been able to say, they're, they're not. Um, they've been allowed to be exempted from the um, e EPA and a lot of other federal agencies because of this, because they've been considered pre um, equivalent. And so the, um, the precautionary principle is not being acted on. We, um, we call for a moratorium on them because of the, um, uh, on GMOs because of their unsafeness. Can I, can I? Yeah, wrap it up in the okay. next few seconds, sure. Antibiotic resistant markers are in a lot of GMOs, and there's a lot of um, resistance to antibiotics that people are experiencing, and they could be tied to this, but we aren't even labeling them, so we don't know. So the um, use of them in our food supply is really dangerous. Also, there's a liability. Um, there's, there should be um, the, the corporations that make these um, these seeds should be liable when they they reduce the saleable 
um, use of a crop to a farmer, and um, when they cause human suffering and animal suffering. And um, we, we, the um, National um, um, Sierra Club also states, and I'm going to read this, we support the right of states and localities to adopt regulations for genetically engineered or organisms more stringent than federal regulations. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure I am. There's a lot that. to choose from there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Ms. Brady. And Mr. Bruce Campbell. Good day, Chair, Chair O'Farrell and Mr. Koretz. So crops are genetically modified to achieve a trait, occasionally two traits. Trait number one, herbicide tolerance or herbicide resistance. And I hear that's 80 to 85 percent of global genetically modified crop acreage, so you can spray virtually unlimited amount of generally, generally it's been the broad spectrum herbicide, mostly Monsanto's Roundup. However, they're moving into Agent Orange Component 2,4-D mixed with Roundup, as well as Agent Orange Component 2,4-D necessarily with dioxin contaminant mixed with another herbicide. And the second main trait is insecticidal bacteria in every cell. And the Bacillus thuringiensis, I first heard about it when there was a gypsy moth problem in oak trees in Santa Barbara. And the natural BT, you could uh, spray on, it biodegrades in sunlight in three days, and you can rinse it off if you're consuming the product. However, if it's in every cell, it's only going to the consumer rather than being able to be washed off or biodegrade. Third main trait is a mixture of herbicide resistance and insecticidal bacteria in every cell. And there was state legislation, which, and the best part was taken out in the Ag Committee, and it would have held the patent holder, mostly Monsanto and Dow AgroSciences, liable for genetic contamination, which is permanent. However, the ag, ag industry was too powerful in Sacramento, and that didn't become law. So we need lo locales like Mendocino, Trinity, Marin, Santa Cruz, City of Arcata, and City of LA to take the lead. Please approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, that concludes the, the public comment uh, uh, section for item three. And uh, just... Uh, this um, GMO-free zone will protect the quality of the food, increasing numbers of people growing it in their homes, schools, and communities. And again, let me just uh, commend my colleague Paul Koretz for all of his great efforts on this. And Paul, I'm glad you're here because if you weren't, I'd be alone up here. So thank you. Always happy to keep you company. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc had to leave for another uh, uh, engagement. Uh, but uh, so this will move to the full city council with instruction uh, from the chair uh, for full approval for consideration of the new ordinance. Uh, so with that, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to come in and, and testify. Thank you so much for that. Councilman O'Farrell, just wanted to yes, let you know this item yes. is calendar for city council tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow it shall be on the full council agenda. So we'll see you in chambers, many of you. Thank you. Um, all right, with that, we will now go to item four. Item number four is motion Koritz Laban O'Farrell relative to instructing the Department of Recreation and Parks and any other relevant city departments to report in 30 days on the policies and procedures that dictate the use of poisons to control the rodent population in the parks and hillside areas of Los Angeles, including the Santa Monica Mountains, Hollywood Hills, and Griffith Park. This item is continued from the April 28, 2014 Arts Meeting. Thank you, Richard. And we have uh, with us for information and presentation, we have Richard Sikorsky. Sikolsky, yeah. Sikolsky, Deputy Agriculture Commissioner for LA County. We also have Marty Friedman, Pest Management uh, with Recreation and Parks, Los Angeles, and then Laura Bauernfield, Fien, uh, Fine. Did I say that right? You did. It's fine, right? Yeah. Uh, with Grounds Maintenance Supervisor uh, with the Los Angeles Recreation and Parks Department. Thank you for having us back. 
Recreation and Parks has conducted a comprehensive review of its IPM program specific to the use of rodenticides. This review included consulting with Los Angeles County Department of Agriculture and other local agencies. As per committee request and based on this review, we have concluded that we are unable to discontinue the use of all rodenticides in our parks, both developed and undeveloped. We are confident that we are using pesticides only as a measure of last resort and in an environmentally sensitive and appropriate manner. To date, in 2014, we have avoided the use of rosenticides at 37 parks by using glue boards for rat and mice control, thereby limiting the use of rodenticides for interior rodents to only 19 locations. To keep our applications in perspective, to date, during 2014, we have only used first-generation anticoagulant rodenticides for ground squirrel control at 15 parks, which is equivalent to only 3% of our total number of facilities. In an effort to be both progressive and responsive, we are phasing out the use of all second-generation anticoagulant rodenticides at all facilities. <laughs> second-generation anticoagulant baits will be replaced with less acutely toxic rodenticides. Additionally, we have begun installing subterranean ground squirrel bait stations to further minimize potential off-target exposure in parks where this is both practical and feasible. Due to the sheer vastness of our operations and considering our primary obligation to maintain safe and healthy parks, we are likewise unable to eliminate the use of rodenticides in our undeveloped urban wilderness areas. These open spaces are frequented by the public and are adjacent to developed and heavily used formal areas of our parks. Because we are compelled to limit public exposure to the health risks posed by uncontrolled rodent populations, we will need to continue to have the ability to utilize rodenticides when appropriate. In order for our pest control operations to be effective, we need to retain the ability to thoughtfully and responsibly utilize our IPM program, including the use of rodenticides when conditions warrant their use. Any local restrictions above and beyond those set forth for enforcement by the State of California effective July 1, 2014 could threaten public safety. I also have a letter that I'd like to maybe summarize um, from Joe Ramirez. Joe Ramirez is, I want to get his title correct, Vector Management Program Vector Borne Disease Surveillance Unit for LA County Department of Public Health. I want to commend you and your crew for the excellent work in managing the ground squirrel problem at Rose Hills Park. I inspected the park on the 29th of August and spoke with 11 patrons, including one with a leash dog. They were all concerned with the damage caused by the ground squirrel infestation and grateful the city resolved the problems in their park. Our primary public health concern regarding ground squirrels and their fleas is the role they can play in the amplification and transmission of the organism that causes plague. The risk factors associated with transmission increases in proportion to human activity and the ground squirrel population. This becomes especially relevant in areas of past positive plague activity such as Griffith Park. Therefore, it is very important to have an ongoing rodent control program in order to reduce the risk of exposure to rodent-borne disease. Judicious use of first-generation anticoagulants rodenticides in conjunction with a robust integrated pest management program has been a useful tool in the management of rodent-borne disease. Managing rodents reduces the risk of exposure to rodent-borne disease and aids in complying with the Los Angeles County Health and Safety Codes related to rodent inf infestations. In 2006, there was a human case of plague in the city of Los Angeles, and the source of exposure was initially suspected to be Griffith Park, where the person had a history of visiting. Because there was an ongoing rodent control program at the park, the possibility of exposure at the park was reduced and ultimately ruled out by investigators. Please keep up the good work. Terrific. Uh, gentlemen. I'm add, here to answer any questions. An answer questions. Um, and again, my name is Marty Friedman. I am the advisor for our department with Rec and Parks. Um, I think if we can give you pictures of some of the products we have used mm -hmm. in installing these subterranean um, mm -hmm. bait stations. Instead of above ground, they are now, it's like a bow box. All you're seeing is something like this cover with holes approximately two feet on the sides, mm -hmm. which the rodent can enter, which really restricts um, off-target pest, mm -hmm. especially children and people that are responsible enough to keep their pets on a leash. Terrific. Um, Thank you. The only thing that we've had incidences where people were off-leash and, and scrupulously 
went through some effort to add, to access our bait stations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we go really over and above, really labeling, and and we follow labels uh, to the letter of the law. I mean, Terrific. Uh, so just to, to give some background, I think, for, for everyone who's here, um, many of whom may not have the full sort of um, uh, evolution of all this, is that uh, uh, my colleague Paul Koretz, along with Tom LeBanche, who had to leave, introduced a motion, which I seconded, uh, that calling for the uh, investigation of use of second generation, uh, specifically second generation rodenticides, in relation to the very disturbing media account of P-22, the mountain lion that lives in Griffith Park, and his poisoning uh, through uh, ingesting rodenticides. Uh, and when it was heard in my committee a couple of months back, I want to say maybe even three months ago or so, I requested a reporting on the feasibility of eliminating all rodenticides, what that would look like across all park systems in Los Angeles. And Laura, you, you addressed that, uh, I think, in, in your, your presentation, uh, to ban all second-generation rodenticides, uh, recreation and parks only, which uh, I understand from your report they are being phased out or have been phased out entirely. That is correct. <clears throat> and then three, ban all rodenticides in regional parks and wildlife areas, so-called natural parks, while keeping first-generation in urban parks and rec centers only. And you just reported that they're in 15, which is about 3% of our parks facilities. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, let's see. With that, um, uh, let's see. Uh, let me ask you this. In terms of, you know, there's the state ban that was put in place. It went into effect in July. Um, do you see any use moving forward of new, um, new products that come on the market that are even more humane? Uh, as I mentioned that the last time, I really loathe the glue traps, but understand also, unfortunately, that especially for Norway rats, from, from what staff has informed me of, that they're the most effective. Um, if you could talk a little bit about other, other uh, mitigation measures. Primary for uh, commensal rodents, like uh, rats and mice that get into our rec centers, the, the primary measure of control is exclusion and good sanitation. And that's always um, the first measure mm -hmm. that we uh, try and take care of. Restricting pesticides is the absolute um, measure of last resort. Mm -hmm. Marty and his staff regularly attend uh, seminars and symposiums where new products are discussed. Marty is frequently speaking with our vendors to s find out what the latest and greatest least toxic products are that are available. We're actually getting ready to begin use of something called the Rat Zapper. Mm -hmm. It's a battery operated device that the rat or mice crawls into and I guess they're electrocuted when they hit the plate. It's very quick and humane. Um, it's so much better than a glue trap. So, so that's, a good, that's a good new product that's being at least rolled out and experimented kind of with? Implemented in some of the rec centers, uh -huh. um, being more sensitive to children. Uh -huh. Terrific. Um, and off, of, the children won't see them out there. Right. They run on 4D batteries. Uh -huh. So it might give somebody, I uh, haven't had anybody willing to test them yet in our crew. Like a real human <laughs> being? <laughs> I'm sure it's a, a, a little zap. It's like taking a nine bolt and putting it on your tongue. Yeah. I'm sure it's a little bit more than that. I doubt you'll find any takers. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we're trying to approach it in a humane way, uh -huh. always going above and exhausting. Um, like mm -hmm. Laura says, we have all my crew have licenses. Mm -hmm. We go, it's 20 to 40 um, hours of units every two year period to renew your license. Mm -hmm. So this incurs us to keeping abreast of all the new changes in laws and regulations. And I think Mr. Sikulski can test to that. I'm always asking him, how are we doing on this? Mm -hmm. I always want to be in compliance. This is our main goal while attending, addressing, mm -hmm. and controlling problems. Okay. I, I love the idea that, of the rat zapper. Yeah. That, that's, we're going to mm -hmm. try that, see how that goes. Um, hopefully they remain in facilities. Mm -hmm. We're trying to see how we can manage mm -hmm. them better. Um, but I think, you know, sanitation, as Laura brought up, is probably the biggest number one mm -hmm. defense yes. on rodents, probably 80, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're instilling in our rec people, because they happen to store a lot of clutter, either equipment, food products, through avenue of um, child 
daycares. Sure. There's a food source there. Right. So food, harborage, shelter, these are the ingredients that attract these vermin. And so can you all go over the uh, issue with there are county and there are certainly state regulations with regard to rodenticides. I understand uh, that some municipalities are actually out of compliance and choose to be so because they'll pay the fines because that's the price of doing business. We tend to comply because of, you know, we're a big city, a big municipality with lots of issues. Can you kind of address that? Um, well, I think uh, the, what you're saying is some, you know, they're willing to kick the can down the road, and I think maybe Richard can address how the city of Santa Monica has, mm -hmm. is it Santa Monica or Malibu? Um, that, that there's, there's, well, there's, it, de account. it depends. Uh, mm -hmm. Santa Monica's had its problems. Malibu's mm -hmm. had its problems. But traditionally, the Palisades Park has been a, quite a big hub of, of ground squirrel problems there. And, mm -hmm. um, the city's been ordered by public health to depopulate or to reduce the population. Mm -hmm. And the, the other factor they have there is the erosion on top of the bluff there is causing a tremendous amount of erosion damage right above Pacific, mm -hmm. right above Pacific Coast Highway there. But it, as far as... The, the pesticides that are, are used in the state of California must be registered by the state of California, Cal EPA. So you have a registration process with the U.S. EPA. That doesn't mean that every pesticide that they registered, California will allow its use here. Uh, it goes through a registration process. There is no local ordinance that can preempt state law, and you can't say, well, we're going to ban the use within our city limits. Mm -hmm. You can set a policy by your departments. But again, the, the state of California, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, which is part of Cal EPA, they maintain that they have registered the products they feel that they're safe for use. Uh, that's their opinion. You and, according to label. Uh, it's just like a medication that the doctor provides you. Mm -hmm. Take two pills three times a day. If you exceed it or change that, who's liable for that? Mm -hmm. The federal label is law, and it, it spells out how to use the material the method and the manner, and that has mm -hmm. to be followed. The site has to be on the label or the commodity, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the pest, as long as it's not prohibitively expressed, do not treat, let's say, for ants. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the regulations that, that are adopted in California and the laws pertain mostly to worker safety, public safety, environmental safety, uh, in, the, in the manner of this material being used, they, depending on what the pesticide is, such as mm -hmm. some of the soil fumigants, there are things in regulation as to how much water you have to put on top of it, what kind of seals so you don't have volatilization, you don't have people exposed to breathing mm -hmm. toxic fumes coming mm -hmm. out of these soil fumigants. But it all, it, it, it varies with the pesticide itself. It starts with the label. Mm -hmm. And the, the new state law that went into effect, which bans second generation uh, rodenticides, it still allows them for pesticide companies for private use. Is that if, correct? If I address that, what, it, what the state did is they made it a restricted use pesticide in California. Mm -hmm. You have federally restricted pesticides and you have California restricted pesticides. Mm -hmm. If it's only federally restricted, then the people applying them or supervising the use have to be a certified applicator, such mm -hmm. as Mr. Friedman. Mm -hmm. They're certified by testing by the state of California and then they take their continuing education, laws and regs. I do seminars where I talk on laws and regs and hopefully educate them on what they should do and not do. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, this, with the state restricted materials, they require not only that they be applied or supervised by a certified applicant or a licensed applicator, they also require a permit. And the permits are issued by the Ag Commissioner's Office mm -hmm. after we review the, uh, the use and the site. Now, that doesn't hold true for what we call non-agricultural sites, such as schools, residential, industrial sites, institutional sites, we don't have to evaluate that property. We can go ahead and just issue the permit. That's the way the state law is set up. To use second or first generation? Uh, no, for, for first generations, they're not, they're not restricted. Mm -hmm. Second generation became restricted July 1st. So right. structural licensed companies that are applying these rodenticides for commercial uh, commensal rodents within 50 feet of a building are exempt from permits. Same company puts a tent on a house to fumigate mm -hmm. it for, for termites. Mm -hmm. Sulfuryl fluoride, Viking, there's several trade names, is a restricted use pesticide. They're not required to get a permit. Mm -hmm. Agricultural licensed companies are, mm -hmm. and that's the difference. And in California, we've gone a little further in distinguishing what we call agricultural use. 
it's not just production of food or ornamental crops. It covers parks, cemeteries, golf courses, right-of-ways. These are all agricultural uses. And so a company that's doing work for hire has to be licensed in that category that covers that type of use by the State Department of Pesticide Regulation, as opposed to the Department of Consumer Affairs that licenses the structural companies. Mm -hmm. They're not as complicated as far as what their use is. When you get into the ag use, it gets very complicated. I'd like to address your compliance question. Yes, please. Um, ultimately, we're responsible for controlling wild squirrel populations. And ultimately, if we, if we fail to control their populations, um, LA County Health can force us to close facilities until we've gotten the populations um, under control. As recent as last summer, LA <laughs> County Health closed a, a campground for an extended period of time until the population was under control. So that is ultimately the compliance threat mm -hmm. that, that we are living up against and trying to, uh, to meet to keep our facility safe and open for the public's use. So you're choosing not to get the permission to use the second generation? You're simply using first generation rodenticides? That is correct. Okay. So it's, it's a policy decision, not a uh, you, you haven't been officially directed to by ordinance or by law. It's just simply a, a, a policy shift. It's a Park. policy shift in the Department of Recreation and Parks in response to the, mm -hmm. the motion that was brought forth and in reviewing our IPM program, we're confident that we can move forward and keep our parks safe without the use of second generation anticoagulants. And do you see that long term? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, can you envision a scenario where, where you are 100% rodenticide free, first or second generation? That would be a wonderful time. I, I don't know if that time is coming anytime soon, but we, we are open to any and pos every possibility to avoid the use of rodenticides, well, absolutely. I mentioned the introduction and encouragement of natural predators, right? Uh, great horned owls, et cetera, uh, that you know, instill a greater balance, even in our parks. Um, do you envision a future? In well, there's still a lot of that. Mm -hmm. predatory and some control. However, mm -hmm. snakes, mm -hmm. we've exhausted gopher snakes for gophers. Can you uh -huh. imagine snake problem now? Elite, so one problem may cause another. Right. A lot of birds of prey only eat, uh, I'm not sure what their diet is, but they're not that frequent. Mm -hmm. When a food source is not there, they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We've thought about putting barn owls and hawk stations and trying mm -hmm. to lure those natural predators, but we have a vast Griffith Park alone. Chatsworth Park areas in the West Valley, those are just conducive mm -hmm. for rodents. Right. You have all these hillsides. You have things unchecked other than natural predators. Mm -hmm. more, if we can reduce all pesticides or eliminate them, mm -hmm. that would be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. But I think that's unrealistic. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate these reports. And what I'm going to recommend is that just we hold this in committee. Uh, and in a year from now, or less than a year from now, actually, July of 2015, the state law will have been in effect. You'll have been one year or so down the road of not using second generation rodenticides. Um, I would love to see what it looks like in terms of um, quantifiable evidence of, of how it's helped or hindered, or um, I would love for you to report back on, on you know, the outcomes of that. If, if you could think of how you could quantify progress. I think the second generations are pretty much, uh, I think those are out of the toolbox. Mm -hmm. I think we're able to use other the tools, so, first generation. So my question is, what kind, what kind of evidence will we see next summer after the law has been in effect for one year? We report regularly and monthly on our pesticide use, and we also have a job order system that tracks all of the, the requests for pest control. So we should be able to, to quantify and come back and report next year mm -hmm. on our progress. Now back to the health department. Again, we, get, we don't look around for ground squirrel populations. We get mm -hmm. that help from the health department. <laughs> so right. they go somewhere and they see an overabundance of ground squirrels and potential plague mm -hmm. or any other major problem that any congregation of large animals um, hunt the virus from the rats and things like this. Right. Um, they give us suppression letters, give us, say, a month time, say, we'll be back, and we would like to see some suppression efforts. So that's, now we know kind of the problem area, so we're pretty much proactive. And I just wish uh, we had Joe Ramirez from the health department um, last month. He couldn't make this meeting, but mm -hmm. if we have another meeting, I hope he can have a voice. Yeah, we'll schedule, I want to keep this open. Uh, and. 
Uh, what I'd also like to, I don't know what I want to do with this yet, but we need to really work on just educating the general public, private property owners who live around our parks, because there's a good chance that P22 was poisoned from a private residence as well, uh, because they can still hire an exterminator and they can use second generation rodenticides, and that arguably is a larger problem. Uh, but what's really great is we're at least, we've at least imposed the policy sure. for the city, which uh, uh, there was overwhelming evidence at the uh, presentation last time. Well, I think taking out of the homeowner's hands is a big step. Yeah. That. And it's still a leap. We don't want to get into that. But the, it's a big leap from a mite that causes the mange. Right. You can make the argument that the weak immune system has been compromised from a bait situation. Right. But at least it's, it's off the even, counter now. And Yes. But I think even the fish and wildlife uh, biologists will have a reasonable argument on that. It's a Wonderful. pretty big leap, although it seems reasonable, but it is a big leap. Wonderful. Council member, we can also do a better job of putting some information on our website, discussing mm -hmm. our integrated pest management program and the efforts that we're making in an effort to educate the public about the work they do or that we're doing and how they can also uh, help support the wildlife in the area. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can work on that. I would love to see that. So... So we'll keep it open, and then I would like you to come back in July of next year okay. to for a progress report, and maybe some interesting things will be, you know, come to the rise to the top uh, that will inform us further on on how to uh, move forward with a you know a more sustainable, um, holistic, rodenticide-free oh, yeah. no, future no, in our parks. Whole, our whole goal is to make it a, a safe place for the public to come and enjoy the parks. That's what it was designed to do. We just get certain areas have issues um, and we need to suppress populations our goal is not to eliminate I think that's right. unrealistic but just to keep it suppressed terrific well I want to thank you all for for being proactive on this and doing such a great job and um, the pictures when p22 was evaluated again he looks better he, does. he matters to all of us we you know he's kind of like um, he's the conscience our of our parks in a way yeah so we hope he doesn't harm anyone. <laughs> we hope that he stays safe and eventually he finds a mate and, you know, there you have it. So thank you so much. And what I'd like to do is offer the floor to my colleague again, Mr. Koretz. Mr. Koretz, if I could just make one more comment here. Yes. Um, as far as the amount of usage of that second generation pesticide, now that it requires a permit, they're not knocking down our doors to get permits because the use is mm -hmm. tr tr uh, primarily around structures. So this mm -hmm. is your structural companies. We never saw a lot of use out where you would have uh, harborage. And I think that's probably a lot of the problems that you have out there with the secondary poisoning is mm -hmm. the homeowners. And now that this has been taken off the market, mm -hmm. it really alleviates a lot of problems that we saw between homeowners taking matters in their own hand and coming up with things like uh, antifreeze which mixed with glass, mm -hmm. ground beef, and a little bit of strychnine. And then people's dogs wind up eating it and dying. So. It's just inhumane. It's a good thing that this is off the market as yeah. far as the, the availability to just the general public. Right. Whether it's a domestic animal or urban wildlife, it's just inhumane, period. So I'm really glad that it's, it's off the market. So thank you. Thank you thank for you. your time. Mr. Koretz? Oh. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if yeah. I could stay here. First of all, I, I wish I could bring uh, P22 here to testify for himself. <laughs> But I think, I think we might have some uh, permitting problems uh, as well as some language problems. But certainly he's, he's the, the poster animal for this problem. Um, we know there's an enormous problem with pesticides and wildlife. I know there's a U.S. Park Service study that found that 92% of dead bobcats in the parks were, had rodenticides in their system. Um, I think we're literally poisoning their food supply. And uh, we're obviously not doing it intentionally, but we're doing almost as bad a job of that. Um, the problem is that rodentic rodenticides are designed not to work very quickly. Because I think the, the primary reason people in their homes don't use rat traps is they don't want to deal with the dead rats. So they're designed to give you the time for the rat to move on to somewhere else and be eaten by a predator. Well, that's the whole problem. Um, we're, we're killing off our wildlife, but we're also killing off predators that could solve the same problem that the pesticides uh, are designed to resolve. So the question is, 
I mean, an owl can can eat something like a, a thousand mice a year. So by killing off owls, we're obviously substituting in the pesticide for the prey. The question is the. Number one, the difference between the uh, uh, first stage and se second stage pesticides. Do the first stage pesticides also have that problem? Are they also eaten by wildlife and, and kill them off? The second generation is usually a, a, second, a single feed, which is uh, more toxic than the, the first generation. Right, so it's killing wildlife yeah, more often. They, sometimes they'll eat it enough to be bait shy go into their burrows and maybe become, uh, you know, just bait shy on that product. Um, but the second generation, which I think was better in some aspects, um, if you look at the wildlife, there was a lot of studies done about, you know, what, if the rodent just freshly ate that bait, was consumed, you know, all this has to be in a relatively short period of time because they do break down prevents the blood from clotting. That can take several days um, to longer. So a, a multi-feed, they would have to eat several feedings to get that same dosage in them. Now, you know, again, I'm not here to argue about the biology. I'm, I don't, I'm not a doctor or a vet. And I don't know the biology. Yeah. That's why I'm asking so, you. <laughs> but but it, I, I had paperwork. I mean, it would have to eat quite a few of these animals to be detrimental. I think the testing is a lot more sensitive than it used to be. Um, what you know, you say ninety something percent. I heard seventy three percent from Fish and Wildlife, but be as it may, um, what? How much was that really the causal agent for death? You know, that's a logical conclusion, but really, well, ninety two percent in the U.S. national parks. That yeah. would be a pretty logical no, it's hard conclusion. To argue those numbers, and I'm not pro pest. However, I'm just into pro. Use, I'm into using products that enough to do the job. Um, I don't. We've used glue boards, trapping. We're trying these zappers. Um, the jury's out. You know, we talk to manufacturers. There hasn't been a product developed. Um, there, there's some that are strychnine, has secondary issues. You know, the rodent was consumed strychnine. A hawk ate that. That would be affected. Um, so these other baits aren't quite as toxic that way. So I wish there was a panacea product that wouldn't be detrimental to anything. But don't Why don't we just use simple traps more often, or as you said, the the, the glue-based, uh, non less toxic? And for product. rats and, and mice, that is our, our primary agent of control. However, in a place like Griffith Park or Elysian or Chatsworth, where you have thousands of acres of open park space, trapping is really not um, a feasible option to gain the kind of control we're obligated to get by LA County Health. Or modifying habitat. Is pretty not cost effective or pretty prohibitive. Is it is it the cost that makes it prohibitive? Could well, we no, could we no, spend no, more and put more traps out in no, Griffith, Griffith Park? Park? How would we remove every rock, nook, and cranny that would be a potential? Glue boards are glue boards are not something you would use for ground swirl control. It would be some kind of like a, a have a heart above ground trap. Um, the rat, the squirrels would crawl into it, and then you'd be obligated to have staff handle the, the pest. It would require a permit from um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to move them or to dispose of them. So there's, it's 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 complicated. It's not it's not that simple. Yeah, even that, there's relocation um, uh, laws that you cannot relocate once you catch. So you have to euthanize them on the spot. I reached out to animal regulations. Maybe they would aid in helping giving the shot. Would be the, probably the best, quickest um, method. Drowning. There's a, a, a cage live trapping called a, a squirrelinator that catches multi-squirrels. Um, like, can you imagine people seeing us with caged animals? I, you know, it's, we're, we're, it's a no-win thing for us, I, I believe. Yeah, I mean, there's not a pleasant and easy answer but it seems like if we're endangering our wildlife yeah. we need to come up with something that's less toxic and we are if we have to euthanize them I, I think we're generally trying to avoid the unpleasantness of the job just as the consumer is and doesn't want to have to use a rat trap and remove the rat themselves um, I, I think we need to to think in a different direction 
and be more willing to do the work intensive less pleasant step rather than endangering all of our wildlife and at the same time interfering with the natural process of, of uh, predator control let's see where the zapper traps go because maybe there will be an outside but protected uh, application at some point for them I just I, I hate glue traps I can't even tell you how much I hate them they're so inhumane the animal dies a horrible slow death they disembowel themselves they squeak and it's it's awful sure. but I understand that you have to you know comply uh, and and so you know I, 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 I encourage just those other more humane you know if it's a 4d battery that sounds pretty good and maybe someday there will be a rodenticide free application you never know we we always have our ear to the ground and we are yeah. always open for suggestions so it's it's an absolute open door open policy to consider you know every possible measure of control absolutely well i, I appreciate the first step that you all have taken without even waiting for this to work its way through the process and hopefully we can continue to move in a less less toxic um, and more humane direction that is our hope as well yeah. thank you for your time thank you so much and we have a lot of comment cards on this as well and we'll just start with that you all have been sitting very patiently I appreciate that we'll do the one minute again um, and we're gonna start with uh, Catherine Luis followed by Simone Reyes followed by Janet Carper thank you very much for allowing the public to weigh in on this and I appreciate uh, Paul Koritz actually came to Earth Day in Griffith Park last this past year, and, and it was kind of very exciting to see him there. Um, and I understand uh, that the city wants to move, at, at least at the moment, toward uh, using first gener generation anticoagulants, but it was that first generation anticoagulant that was responsible for the uh, poisoning of uh, P22. And uh, additionally, according to the study by researchers from UCLA and the National Park Service, 77% of bobcats in five counties have been affected by these first generation rodenticides. That's huge. Um, but here's the bottom line. Whatever the city decides today, will have an impact on tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good time. Ms. Reyes. Um, I'm Simone Reyes. I'm a longtime animal advocate. I had my own television show that highlighted a lot of uh, animal rights issues called Running Russell Simmons. Um, I recently traveled to Japan with Sea Shepherd to help uh, stop the dolphin slaughters there, which we're still fighting against. And I cannot save animals in my own backyard. Um, it is horrifying to see um, animals struggling, animals that are dead on the side of the road, and we highly suspect that it is because of the rat poison. I actually advocate on behalf of all life. Um, in suffering, we are all equal, even the rats. And so I would love it if we could, as a community and as a state, start to implement non-lethal ways of dealing with um, issues that seem to be a problem for some, and uh, have a healthy, strong ecosystem which will put everything in balance. Because as the saying goes, and I have three seconds, um, so goes California, so goes the nation. Wouldn't it be amazing if California set a precedent that didn't just uh, view some animals as pests and others as pets, but all life as something that needs to be respected and eventually taken care of by California. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, and Janet Carper will be followed by uh, Eric Barkalow and then Laura Howe. Good afternoon, Council Members. I'm Janet Carper with CLAW. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really synchronicitous that this uh, hearing was preceded by the GMO hearing because we can, it really highlights the fact that everything is connected and human beings have encountered this problem throughout time that we cannot isolate something, try to manipulate something without affecting pretty much everything else. And um, I really commend the Department of um, Parks and Recs for the 
bold, sweeping gestures. I know it's very hard to change things, but uh, it's wonderful how their ear is on the ground and, and they're open, and this is all tremendous and really a leading uh, force. And I'm so happy to know that. And I, I just want to encourage to keep in mind the interconnectedness of everything that even the first generations, however, do have impact, albeit slower than the second generation. And, um, and that um, we, we really... I mean, we know, I know that sounds like we're asking them to invent the better mousetrap. It's, you know, such a hard uh, thing to do. But um, to please keep in mind about um, the, uh, the fact that those animals, however, will still be in the food chain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Um, I came with a prepared statement that I don't have with me right now, but it's coming. Um, I do want to say a couple of things. Paul and, and Mitch, you were asking about uh, rodenticides and, and the phase one and phase two. Um, my understanding um, is that the phase two stay in the body longer. So when a bobcat eats a rat that has that in them, it stays in their body for three to six months instead of a few days or a few weeks, whereas the, the type ones uh, don't last that long in the system. And so it builds up over time in their systems and that's one of the major issues. Uh, I, I am a docent at a feline conservation center, so the predators are, are kind of my thing. And we talked about earlier um, the GMOs, and uh, we don't want to ingest those poisons into our systems. Well, the bobcats and the mountain lions and the raptors should have the same choice. And the only way we can do that is by eliminating it, not only in our parks, but the step that was taken by the state is, is a huge thing. Uh, the prepared statement I want to read real quick here is from the Bark Avenue Foundation and LA Animal Services New Hope Partner that spays and neuters 2,500 LA dogs and cats every year as well as moving LA Animal Services dogs. Um, they basically are saying it's just not enough. Um, they've seen it, it happens. It's not just the rodents that die, it's the dogs and the cats and the uh, obviously the other wildlife. So I appreciate you listening. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Laura Howe will yes. be followed by Kathy Shoemaker and uh, Kelsey Everly. Hi, I'm Laura Howe. I'm from Friends of Griffith Park, and I thank both of you. I especially thank Paul Koretz for speaking today. I think that there's so much on this issue that there's not even enough to tap into it, but to me it seems like a lot of people are having trouble understanding the chemistry and the biology. We have biologists. There's like three different studies going on in Griffith Park right now about rodenticides. Why isn't there more communication between the city and these biologists? It's about also about, and I appreciate the movements, I know that it's not easy, I really appreciate, I work with a lot of people in Park and Recs, and I know their job is huge, but it's time to make changes. Changes, I mean, they're difficult, they're not, it's like it's not the fun stuff of picking up the dead rats, it's about educating the public, it's about, and we, and that's the thing, I think the city has to set the precedent, they have to be the example, and if we're expecting the public, which is the probably, you know, 80% to 90% of the problem. We, we have to lead the way as the city because these chemicals still are going to be in the system of these animals. We want, we talk about, we preach this thing about wanting to have biodiversity, about ecosystems. If we're poisoning our wildlife, if we want wildlife, we can't poison it. And also, I just have a question in regards to the concessions in Griffith Park. I, as a runner, as a hiker, I see that there's all these concessions that are in the wilderness and they have rat traps all around the Greek, the observatory, all the food stations. And I think there needs to just be better communication in terms of what and how much is being used. Okay, thank you. That's a good point. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Kathy Schoonmaker. Hi, I'm Kathy Schoonmaker. and Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. And I'm an urban um, wildlife conservation specialist for the National Park Service. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the difacinon, which is part of the first generation compounds, and how we have seen it in our bobcats. We've seen it in um, over 40% of our bobcats tested livers. Um, after they've died, we've seen it in their blood system. Unfortunately, it doesn't stay in the liver, so we do miss a lot of it, um, it because it breaks down and doesn't have the same half-life that um, the second generation does, but it is out there. And um, specifically with P1, um, or P22, our Hollywood cat, um, and all the other mountain lions. We've had it in 50% of our mountain lions throughout the Santa Monica Mountains. That's just in the Santa Monica Mountains, not throughout the state. And um, with P22, he was directly exposed to that as well, um, difacelone, and um, that's what we found in the blood for him. And I would just like um, the parks here to 
work with other, um, I know that um, Caneo Park and Recs, or Recreation and Park District, um, has um, been redensified free for 10 years. And part of that is from the study that we have done. And um, I would urge you guys to um, communicate with them, see how they've done it. They have over 50 parks that are next to urban and um, open space areas. Thank you. Thank you. We will follow up. Thank you for that. And Kelsey Everly will be followed by Heather Hyde and Teresa Brady. Good afternoon. I'm Kelsey Everly speaking today on behalf of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is a nonprofit um, organization representing 100,000 members that works to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. And we uh, strongly support eliminating the use of all rodenticides, first and second generation. Um, in the parks and wilderness areas of Los Angeles. Uh, these dangerous rodent poisons wreak havoc on our native ecosystems and indiscriminately kill uh, thousands of um, bobcats, um, uh, raptors, other uh, mountain lions. Um, and we applaud Rex and Parks' re recent um, policy shift towards phasing out second generation, uh, but we think there's more to be done. We think we should move towards eliminating all rodenticides. Um, and as we just heard, there, there's no such thing as a safe poison for wildlife. There's no environmentally sensitive way of um, spreading poison in our, in our parks. Um, and I'd also just echo your sentiment that the best um, conservation measure is uh, coyotes and bobcats. They're the most effective uh, controllers of squirrel and bird populations. So thank you. Thank you. And Heather? Mm -hmm. Thank you again for your time. Um, I wanted to address a couple issues that I don't think that have been addressed that I know are a problem with uh, rodenticide uh, as well in wildlife. Um, basically, like as far as I know, my dogs. My dogs will pick up other animals' droppings. Um, sometimes on a daily basis, on a walk, I have to pull like a feces from some other animal out of their mouth. They try to snatch it quick. That other animal could have been infected by rodenticide. And if, if my dog gets affected by that, that would be absolutely devastating. So I think the fact of the matter that you have to also consider even cats. You know, I'm sure that they pick up these rodents that are infected by rodenticide. My dogs, you know, I'm an animal rights activist. I don't, I'm not uh, for hunting, but my dogs don't know that. I can't tell them, don't kill that animal, you know. So my dogs at times have killed a bird, have had a possum in its mouth, you know. And, and if my loved one was affected by it, it, you know, it would be devastating. So that's something that I also think that, you know, I'd love it for you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. And Teresa Brady will be followed by Jeff uh, I think it's Gladys, and uh, then Tony Tucci. Okay. Um, just, I just wanted to uh, present a letter from another organization that I'm involved with, and that's the Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Area Steering Committee. And we strongly support this effort to eliminate the anticoagulants mm -hmm. because we do agree that um, owls and bobcats can be um, ha effective in controlling rats in a park. And they are are killed often by eating rats. One of our members, Deborah George, recommended that we get more owl boxes. Mm -hmm. And she actually wrote this letter. So I'll submit this. It's also in the record already, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Jeff, is it is it Gladys? Is it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, my obviously, my name is Jeff Gladys. Mm -hmm. um, pest control business, licensed with the state of California, LA based. Um, Initially, I did use first and second gen, and I haven't done it for seven years. Um, we do, you know, from hotels to ma mainly residential homes. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had feedback from uh, most of the people that we do work for, and they've said that they've actually seen gopher snakes come along. They've seen more owls and hawks come along, mm -hmm. coyotes, you know. And this is proof in the pudding when they're telling me this. Um, so... You know, I completely agree with integrated pest management, you know, sanitizing, um, exclusion. Uh, and I'd also agree with the rat zappers. Mm -hmm. Those are brilliant. That's mainly what we use. Mm -hmm. um, glue boards are hideous, mm -hmm. um, as you were mentioning. 
Yes. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that if the integrated pest management, you know, was, you know, stuck to, yeah, it is legwork, but at the same time that will give, you know, the birds of prey and such a little chance to catch up and start doing their job naturally. So, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I want to get your card before you go. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Tony will be followed by uh, Kian Schulman, Schulman, sorry, and Skip Haynes. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Tony Tucci. I am a director of CLAW, or Citizens for Los Angeles Wildlife, and I'd really like to thank you. I'd really like to thank Rec and Parks and say, my, how far we've come since the last meeting, the last committee meeting here in April. Um, the awareness has, has, in fact, said that we are phasing out and that uh, out of the toolbox is second generation rodenticide. However, I'd like to respectfully ask that you do not hold that particular item that you actually memorialize it, that you actually get it in writing. Please move to draft ordinance, make it policy, be it an understood policy on all lease agreements, concession agreements, request for proposals. Be sure that every exterminator or rodent control company that subcontracts with rec and parks are, are renters and vendors of rec and parks. Understand that we prohibit the application of second generation anticoagulant coagulant rodenticide in all areas of LA City Park properties. I wanted to mention that the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, it is their written policy for uh, nine years, 100% rodenticide free. I'm going to share uh, their, their action with you guys. Thanks, Tony. And just for the record, I'm keeping the file open. I'm not noting and filing it so it goes away. I'm keeping it open uh, so that we can explore you know, yeah. what, I'm, what I'm asking you is if, if second generation specifically, mm -hmm. if you're not using it, mm -hmm. let's get it in writing today. Thank you. Thank you. You're here. <laughs> Kian Shulman. Shulman. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Kian Shulman with Poison Free Malibu, and we strongly support policy against the use of rodent poisons by the City of Los Angeles and encourage the committee to take strong action mandating that all anticoagulant poisons not be used by the Recreation and Parks Department here. Diphasinone is a highly toxic to humans and other mammals by inhalation, dermal absorption, and ingestion. The National Park Service has identified diphasinone the first generation anticoagulant that you're using as the poison that killed that 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 is affecting p22 los angeles scientist los angeles uh, laurel searles has found diphasinone the first generation that you're using was the cause of 77 percent of poison bobcats in a five county southern california study by ucla and national park services a, a study by the epa study uh, uh, determines that Diphasinone is uh, hazardous to mammals and predators and scavengers. 58% were affected by this. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, the California Coastal Commission passed the Santa Monica Local Coastal Plan that all first and second generation anticoagulants were, were banned as of uh, October 10th, including the clause, all anticoagulants shall be prohibited. Seven cities now include resolutions that uh, uh, that opposed all anticoagulant resolution, uh, all anticoagulant poisons, including diphasinone. Diphasinone use is entirely inappropriate where wildlife has access. Uh, there are uh, uh, various uh, uh, facilities that have uh, done no poisons, such as Marin County. Please look up them. City of Malibu has not used any poisons on their property. Trapping is the way to go. If we don't trap, we're just discard, we, are, we are discarding these toxic wastes into our neighbor's property. It is, uh, it is polluting the environment and the food chain with the poison. So we're, we are not, we're turning the other way. We're polluting the environment and we're uh, uh, poisoning the food chain. So we hope that you can please uh, avoid this over pollution of our environment. Trapping is the superior strategy and has been successful in many programs throughout uh, uh, California. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Ms. Shulman. Thank you. Uh, Skip will be followed by Allison Simard, Simard and, uh, and then um, Andrew Douglas. I'm sorry, Doyles. <coughs> yes, uh, gentlemen, I'd just like mm -hmm. to say I'm really glad to see you here because if you weren't here, the animals would have no protection. I'm kind of appalled that the rest of the committee members aren't here. Here. But that said, you've done a really great job, 
in getting recs and parks to stop using second generation. To get the city to move on anything is absolutely amazing. And thank we, you. And and I, we have to, I have to thank my staff, Skip. They yeah, they did a great this. job. They did a really, really good job. Really on it. So and I, I I'm, thank my staff. As you know, I'm with, I'm with yeah. Claw. Yeah. I'm with Claw, and I would just like to say, mm -hmm. Claw actually starting today uh, has instituted a barn owl box program. We will provide barn owl boxes for anyone who wants them, providing we get the donations to cover it, because each box costs about $200. And our requirement for take, putting a barn owl box on your property is you have to go around to at least 20 of your neighbors and introduce yourself and introduce their new neighbor, the barn owl, and, and ask your neighbors to stop using rodenticides. So it's really an anti-rodenticide problem. We just put it up on our website. We're going to continue doing it. We also have an idea. We'd like to work with the city on a uh, campaign to clean up the city. Because bottom line, 50 to 60% of rodent problems are caused by sloppy food, you know, and so forth. That also brings coyotes and the other animals in. So we would like to talk to the city about starting a campaign mm -hmm. to do it. And once again, we'd just like to thank you guys for what you've done. Because this is monumental. This is going to go out all over the country as soon as we get out of here. There are people all over the country waiting to hear about this, that the city of Los Angeles has actually made movement. So thank you very much. And thank you to the staff who's ever here. Yes, Christine and David and Star have, have really been... Council Member Corrects' office and as well. Court. Staff. Well, it goes without saying. <laughs> and staff. You got it. Okay. Thank you. Allie? Um, Allison Samard, Citizens mm -hmm. for Los Angeles Wildlife. You know, it, it's been a year since we started talking with your offices about um, about the dangers of, P, of, of rodenticide. Uh, in that time, then it uncovered that P22 was sick. P22 is, has, has been given vitamin K and, and is clawed. Uh, clotted and is, is out there, but we are terrified that it's going to happen again. We're terrified that, you know, there were dogs that were accidentally poisoned, there's cats, there's scores of anonymous animals that are not as famous as P22 that are dying every day. It's raining raptors in the canyons. We are hearing reports of this. And and while we are thrilled about this, this new uh, step by rap to get rid of second generation, that's a huge step. But as many have mentioned difacinum, which is the active ingredient in squirrel bait, is still extremely toxic, and and we really do need to look at that. And you can see, you know, we have 2,500 signatures in the file. We have uh, all of these groups, including National Park Service and Center of Biological Research, and, Re and rodents are the solutions, and Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, and Poison Free Malibu, and Defenders of Wildlife, and Sepulveda Basin Steering. All of these groups, and many I haven't mentioned, that are here to celebrate the the end of second generation rodenticide in our parks and our wilderness areas and really encourage you know that we find a way around first generation there's no good reason and the other thing is that we keep talking about the fear of disease hantavirus doesn't come from squirrels so why are we bringing that up anymore the 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 um, bubonic plague is treated with a round of antibiotics so this is not it's not you talked about the trans, the second uh, 21st century thinking mm -hmm. We need to compare that with our fears that we're spreading from the health department. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. And Andrew. Thanks again for this opportunity. Sure. Biodiversity day indeed. Um, <laughs> my hat's off to the Rec and Parks Department and the Ag Commissioner. They do really great work, and um, I appreciate their forward-thinking progress on this. However, I also um, felt somewhat uh, disconcerted when to hear that there wasn't more of a open arms approach to reaching out to the nonprofit sector. Um, there are easily at least a dozen different nonprofits that do integrated pest management by reintroducing predatory species, uh, red tail hawks, mm -hmm. um, peregrines, owls were mentioned, but like I've seen them in action uh, because I've done a lot of work growing food on the West LA VA campus, which is a very similar um, environment where you have different levels of species. Um, a little known fact is that on the California flag there are all these black things underneath the bear where the bear is walking and it's presumed that it's actually the um, bear paw prints but they're not. There's actually many more of those spots on the flag than there are um, 
bear legs, and it's because they actually are gophers. And that's how long gophers have been here. They've been here for millions of years. They'll be here long after we're gone. Sides are just going to make them procreate more often. Um, and then since the plague was mentioned, there's a growing consensus that actually it was the decimation of the predatory species of cats that actually allowed the rats to proliferate. And it was out of an institutionalized, preconceived notion that people were going after cats at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And that concludes public comment on item four. And as I mentioned, I will keep the file open and we'll have reports back on progress, um, new um, methods to control pests. Um, and then we'll get, oh, there's another speaker on this item. Miguel. Okay. Oh, Miguel, my apologies. I didn't, I didn't see your card, but come on up and please give your last name, Miguel. Uh, oh, you know what? I have you on general comments. That's why. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. M Miguel Ordanya. Ordanya. Yeah. So, okay. So, item four, you got it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, good to so, see you again. Good, good to see you. Um, I'm an urban carnivore biologist, and I'm also a longtime resident of the Griffith Park neighborhood area. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm coming here to basically another suggestion to not include first generation rat poison into your integrated pest management. Um, we've heard a lot of evidence today that it's possible to be without all rodenticide poison. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to document uh, P22 with a, another team of biologists and also um, look at his improvement with camera traps in the park that we do research with. And looking at his improvement, it's it's Gives, gives us hope, obviously, and that's, that's great. Um, but I also have footage of him eating raccoons opp opportunistically, which is another reminder that um, he is always going to be vulnerable to rat poison, as well as other wildlife. And even though uh, he does look a little bit better, it doesn't mean that he's out of the woods. And without more communication between pest managers and the local community, the golf course, the LA Zoo, um, vendors throughout the park, this is never going to go away because a cultural shift needs to happen and it's not just enough for some, a sm small bit of policy to change. So uh, I hope you look, have a lot more forward thinking and, and hopefully the pest managers of the city are less reactionary and more um, forward thinking when they kind of develop their new strategy moving forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miguel. All right, that, that does conclude public comment on item four. Uh, so we're going to keep the file open, and we will uh, have reports back from Rec and Parks County, whomever we need to, on this item moving forward as we make our way to a more humane uh, city process for dealing with um, animals that challenge us. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Um, and before we close the meeting, we have one general uh, comment card, uh, and that is from... My friend, Laura Gutierrez. Good afternoon, Mitch. Good afternoon. Councilmember Coretz. My name is Laura Gutierrez. I'm a longtime resident of Los Angeles. Sixteen years ago, I had a stroke. And for 14 years since, I've had no health insurance. I was able to get by with clinics and purchasing my medications and hope to God that I didn't have another recurring stroke. Um, because of the implementation of the ACA Act, um, I was able to get insurance because I had been working, I was taking care of my mother, I qualified for Medi-Cal. Um, I have worked with county in the past. I'm also a retired registered nurse. And I can tell you right now that when the petitions went around from um, AHF um, having the city take over its own health department, I gladly signed it. Um, there are major problems with the county. I mean, I'm hearing that these people are having problems with the public health department in county right now with the pesticides. Um, there are issues, health issues, that women and children and elderly and disabled people are having right now. And I can't see how 
how the, 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 the LA Health City Commission is not being implemented. I know you have to dot your I's and cross your T's with the city government and so forth, but you know, there needs to be some kind of movement to go forward. This is the second year that ACA is going to be in implementation. I myself right now, I am looking at purchasing my insurance with my own salary again because now I'm able to because I can get insurance with a predisposing disease. But many people are not and they're having some issues and I think if anything, you need to urge the city. You need to urge the city attorney's office, the C, I, I believe it's the C, CAO. CAO. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, because this really needs to be implemented. And, and I'm not here for, for AHF. I'm here for myself as a county patient. Um, I just lost two and a half hours of t my time today just trying to get a doctor change. And I got nowhere. Thank you, Laura. And just so you know, the um, the... City Health Commission is agendized for next Monday in this committee. It so is. it's on. It's on the. It'll be on the agenda for next Monday. I appreciate. Yes, it. you bet. Great. All Thank right. you. Thank so you. I'm not a member of this committee, yeah. but I will say from everything I've heard, it seems like we're pretty close to getting this implemented. Yeah. So we'll have a report from the City Attorney's Office and CAO next Monday, right where you're sitting. Thank you. So. I'll be out of town, okay, but, but we'll, we'll report back. Yeah. Well, All right. No, I'm sure you ha we'll have yeah. people here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that adjourns this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.